You're listening to Don't Waste Water. We use very, very low energy to destroy PFAS, long and short chain, and we're commercially at scale. We're processing wastewater, various different types and sorts, at a full scale commercially at customer sites. There are no destruction technologies that are doing that right now, and there are none that can do it economically. So we can do Hello, bonjour, and welcome to the Don't Waste Water podcast. So there are a lot of studies on this, and then there are a lot of studies that are trying to invalidate those studies, <laughs> right? And so I am an engineer, right? So I like to look at the data, and data suggesting that they're harmful, and suggesting certainly that they're carcinogenic. The whole thing of this is that it is so incredibly frustrating and worrisome and ambiguous to the industry as to what they really need to treat to, how they're going to treat it or manage it, and what the liabilities are looking like. We're just doing our best to make sure that we can meet their needs now and that we have the, the capability to add on and build to the system as regulations get stricter and more compounds become regulated. I'm your host, Antoine Valter, and in today's episode, I'm delighted to welcome Julie Blissmullen as my guest. Let's put a pH probe. <laughs> Around the plates. <laughs> what happens? Let's let's do the thing with the ORP. Let's run some through a spectrophotometer. I'm just trying to quantify, trying to understand what's happening from a, from an oxidation standpoint, from a reduction standpoint. I also have a degree in environmental policy. It's technically in environmental and sustainability studies. So my brain is always like thinking, you know, yeah, I was going for an engineering PhD, but is there something like this out there? This is amazing. Julie is the CEO and founder of A Clarity. To size something up from just a couple plates to a prototype that works to something that can be manufactured, to something that can be deployed at a customer site, and to something that works as economic, clearly it has taken many years. And while a lot of these corporations have massive amounts of funding, way more than a little of clarity, <laughs> we have a full team. We are all dedicated to destroying PFAS with one product, essentially. We've been just laser focused. A Clarity makes dealing with PFAS hassle-free by helping landfills and wastewater treatment plants destroy PFAS forever. In this season, I'm presenting you the coolest kids in the water town. But who sets the rules as to who's cool and who's not? Me? Well, yes, but I still have some objective criteria. First, you know the saying, follow the money. So last week we had 2023's largest fundraiser on the mic with Gradient, the first and only water tech unicorn. Now, if I look up again 2023's list of growth capital investments and I exclude later stage companies like Gradient and its Series D to only focus on Steed to Series A rounds, I still have about $330 million to track. Sure, those have been distributed across 72 deals. But if I cluster them by applications, some clear trends appear. Fields like digital water, membranes, and decentralized solutions received good chunks, but they all ended up behind the clear number one, PFAS. So that's our first hint. Something's happening in the PFAS field, we probably should care, and we have in the past, for instance, across my two discussions with Henrik Hageman, the founder of Pure Affinity on that microphone. Pure Affinity that, by the way, raised a $13.9 million Series A in 2023. Now, if you're a regular listener of this podcast, you know that until very recently, I've asked all my guests to advise me someone to speak to next. I compiled all those hints, and there as well, there's a clear number one. With five recommendations, Julie is the water entrepreneur voice my podcast alumni craved to hear the most. So it was about time for me to take action. Hence, without further ado, let me leave her the floor. Just before that, a short reminder. If you like what you hear, take this episode and share it with a friend, a colleague, your boss or your team. And I'll meet you on the other side. Hi, Julie. Welcome to the show. Hi, Antoine. So great to be here. Thank you. I've been waiting far too long to have the conversation. You've been recommended by countless guests on that microphone, and I'm super excited about what we're going to discuss today. I found that paper from Alison Ling, and I'm sure you read it because actually I found it because you liked it. That's a hint. Yes, I did. <laughs> The paper shows that there is not enough money in the world to remove PFAS from the environment as fast as we're adding it. So does that mean we're doomed? No, we're not doomed. But that's such a complex question because are we doomed from a societal impact, from a political impact, from a health impact? I don't think we're doomed in any of those necessarily. With regulations tightening, it is certainly causing 
a lot of financial issues and, and economic issues, the, the economic impacts. There are thousands of impacted communities with PFAS just in drinking water. So that's where Ali's paper was talking about the cost of remediation. So are we doomed? No, we're not doomed. But we darn got to get creative as to figure out how we're going to clean it up. And then we also have to get really creative and work with the legislatures, um, chemical companies to try and limit the use and exposure of PFAS so that we can protect future generations because that's first and foremost really what we should be doing. That's for me, and, and then I promise the rest of the question will be serious, but that one is actually half serious still because I heard that discussing with people. If PFAS is in 98% of the people's blood, probably in your blood, probably in my blood, can it be that dangerous? So there are a lot of studies on this. And then there are a lot of studies that are trying to invalidate those studies. <laughs> right? And so I am an engineer, right? So I like to look at the data. And data suggesting that they're harmful and suggesting certainly that they're carcinogenic. And that, what's interesting to me is like, look at where PFAS is in the bulk, in aggregate, in the environment. You do find cancer clusters. I'm not one to like twist the story here, but causation is a real thing. Those that live by areas with a lot of PFAS have elevated levels of cancer. We live in a world where 40% of people, you know, 40% technically, there's a risk <laughs> of getting cancer. Um, that wasn't the case a couple decades ago. And not to say that PFAS hasn't been around for decades, because it has. There's certainly a link between some of these chemicals and cancer. Are we doomed? No. But my gosh, if there wasn't PFAS and a lot of these other cancerous chemicals in the environment, would the risk of cancer be a lot less? I think so. Before we go into the full story, what's your differentiated approach with a clarity and what's really to pitch to the company? We develop and deploy proprietary systems that destroy PFAS and liquid waste. We focus mostly in destroying PFAS where it is found, you know, in, in a decent concentration, decent bulk concentration. We found that destroying PFAS in landfill leachate is a really good place to start. Almost 50% of PFAS that's manufactured ends up in a landfill, in the trash. And these landfills are under a lot of scrutiny right now. <laughs> in the past, they could discharge the, the, the leachate to a local stream or river. Over the past couple decades, they've been sending typically their leachate to a wastewater treatment plant. Now, the wastewater treatment plants are under a lot of scrutiny, so they're charging a decent amount of money to accept this landfill leachate. So that's the nasty, you know, rainwater. It's costing a lot of money. There's a significant amount of downstream risk for the landfills and also for the wastewater treatment plants. So we're destroying PFAS, you know, a lot at land, in landfill leachate at the landfills. We're doing remediation work, working with some conventional industrial plants. In terms of differentiators, what are we competing against? <laughs> well, we're competing against discharge to wastewater from a land, sometimes deep well injection, or maybe concentration into a very small volume and solidification of that of that liquid, of that PFAS. In drinking water, I would say we're competing more against activated carbon capture and ion exchange capture. Are you competing with activated carbon and ion exchange in drinking water, or are you adding an additional layer on top of them? Uh, so I think it's both. In some ways we're competing, in other ways we're working with them, especially when it comes to regenerable media right? Resins or carbon or whatnot. If we're able to regenerate the carbon or the resin, then take that brine and destroy the PFAS in the brine. Well, now <laughs> we, we essentially have a closed loop solution, which is fantastic. I just want to say too, the EPA, you know, EPA has published a, or is in the process of publishing best available technology for drinking water, for treating PFAS. And certainly activated carbon and resins, single use resins, top. I don't think they have any innovative, newer type of, of technology. Even I don't even believe that regenerable media is on there. Certainly, just no destruction technology is made it onto the, to the best available technology list. I'm talking specifically in the U.S., but I, I would believe a similar in, the, in Europe as well. So that makes it a little bit challenging, but it's also EPA's job is, you know, what we're trying to do, and I'm meeting with EPA to try and figure out how we can help utilities and, you know, and help communities try and augment what essentially is going to be a massive supply chain issue <laughs> when these utilities now are regulated and they have to treat. If we can regenerate some of those resins and other types of media and then destroy PFAS, it's complementary. I'll come back to the regulation later because it's one of these interesting cases for you where regulation can be positive and negative, but more to that later. I just found an article when I was looking, what's your path? And that article was quoting you. I can't tell if it's a journalist's 
enthusiasm, or if it's really your quote, but you, you'll tell me, and you were saying in that article that your elimination rate is 10 to 15 times that of competitors, and your OPEX and CAPEX is three to 10 times better. First, would you confirm those numbers? And if you do, when you say competitors in that stage, are you comparing to activated carbon and ion exchange, or are you comparing to the other technologies that eliminate PFAS? Yes. So we're comparing to the other technologies that, that eliminate or destroy PFAS. You know, this is a massively dynamic market. And so government, end users, partners, technology companies, everybody's trying to figure out the best way to handle PFAS from an environmental impact standpoint, but certainly from an economic standpoint. In presenting those numbers, those figures, I'm presenting data that's comparative to other types of destruction technologies. This could be other electrochemical oxidation technologies. It could be supercritical water oxidation technologies, plasma technologies. But essentially on the differentiator question, which I didn't quite answer, we use very, very low energy to destroy PFAS, long and short chain, and we're commercially at scale. We're processing wastewater, various different types and sorts at a full scale commercially at customer sites. There are no destruction technologies that are doing that right now. And there are none that can do it economically. And so we can do that. And both long and short chains as well. The question might be what exactly falls into destruction technologies? Because I see what you're meaning by that. And I see to whom you're comparing. And in which case, I 200 persons subscribe to what you just said. Now there's a gray zone about the ones. But I don't want to go into the gray zone or not straight ahead. Actually, your low energy point makes me a smooth transition because if I try to understand what allows you to be lower energy than all the others, the only rational I can find is you've stumbled, probably not by accident, you've looked into it, but you stumbled upon something which is really brilliant and which you patented at the time you were in your PhD research. What happens in 2016 when you find that reactor and you feel like you have to patent it straight away? You know, I was working on my PhD, looking at innovative water treatment technologies, specifically for contaminants of emerging concern. But I also did a lot of work with disinfection byproducts and some, you know, a lot of other drinking water stuff. I came from the drinking water industry and uh, a lot of my work came from from there originally. I didn't know anything about electrochemistry, but one of the kind of mini, it was actually really a side project, was looking at different anodes and cathodes, which really a lot of it comes down to the anodes and cathodes and how they're configured and geometries, flows, all of that. And yeah, I mean, I was able to some extremely basic tests. Let's put a pH probe <laughs> around the plates. <laughs> what happens? Let's let's do the thing with the ORP. Let's run some through a spectrophotometer. I'm just trying to quantify, trying to understand what's happening from a, from an oxidation standpoint, from a reduction standpoint. I also have a degree in environmental policy. It's technically in environmental and sustainability studies. So my brain is always like thinking, you know, yeah, I was going for an engineering PhD, but is there something like this out there? This is amazing. We were disinfecting bacteria and viruses. And this was back in 2000 and yeah, 15, 16. And I was introduced to, to PFAS in 2010 when I was working for the US EPA. Back then they were called PFCs. When I was doing my PhD, I always was trying to like, oh man, is this going to work for PFAS? Because the thought is, and it still kind of is, so it's a little bit of a myth now. It's very much of a myth with, with the clarity and, and these other technologies. But that carbon fluorine bond in PFAS is the strongest bond in nature. And it's impossible to break. And I even had somebody, uh, I wrote my first grant to fund the company on, on PFAS destruction. And somebody said, if you're actually breaking the carbon fluorine bond, that can't happen. Like you would you would win a Nobel Prize. And there are people that had done this, right? So I'm not going to be the first one by any means. But, but it really was thought, you can't break the carbon fluorine bond. It's the strongest bond known in nature. And you're a little bit crazy to think to think that you could do all of this spiraled out, all this great disinfection stuff, all the advanced oxidation, eh, potential for PFAS. The tech transfer office at the University of Massachusetts, they essentially said, you guys have seen the on this because I think there's something here. As we had that dialogue, I really made sure that it was done. And, you know, hindsight's 2020, it probably could have been done a heck of a lot better than it was. But, <laughs> but I did get that first. Filed. At the time you, you filed the patent, PFAS, if it's not regulated today, almost 10 years later, it wasn't regulated in 2015 either. Do you have that instinct which tells you there's going to be a market, I need to make it a company? I spent a fair amount of years under trying to understand contaminants of emerging concern. Like I said, especially in drinking water. And I looked at one for dioxin. I mean, I actually like dosed one for dioxin. Like, like, you know, I was like a chemist, you know, trying, trying to... You just remind me of that, is that in 2015, the big topic was one for dioxin. So that was the thing people were looking after. It was. It was. Pharmaceuticals and pesticides and hormones. But the thing is like, they all could be degraded. And I did it electrochemically, but I mean, 
I spent many years doing other advanced oxidation work with ozone, hydrogen peroxide, UV light, and many other ways, but they didn't touch PFAS. I kind of inherently knew from working at the, at the EPA as well that we got a big problem here. It's incredibly pervasive. We understood the pervasiveness and the relative toxicity. I mean, it was talked about as if it was toxic and carcinogenic at the time. There are still people trying to fight that now. But in my mind, I was like, the best we can do is capture it. And then you just put it back into the landfill or you put it back into the wastewater treatment plant or dump it out and it doesn't get treated. So so I, I understood, yeah, there's got to be a massive market here. Very bright minds in water academia don't have it in their DNA to straight away feel like there's got to be a market and I might be the person to look after that market. So is it natural for you to spin out and to found a clarity or is it a big hurdle for you to overcome? When I started my PhD, one of the reasons I started the PhD was because I had a fellowship from the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. And when I was going through the interview process and selecting a school for my PhD and whatnot, I actually told the advisors that I didn't want to be on the bench, work on the bench for the rest of my life. I enjoyed the research part of it, but I really liked the applied side. I actually said that. <laughs> Looking back, I was so surprised that they accepted me. <laughs> Um, but I knew that I was not going to be doing academic research for the rest of my life. But I kind of wanted to get that base knowledge. But I didn't know I was going to found the company. It just, it all happened. Um, in hindsight, I guess, you know, it wasn't magic. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, yeah, I, w I was pretty proactive in filing the patent. I took some business courses. I really changed my focus. Once Once I really was convinced that there was something here, I wasn't the best PhD student. And I moved across campus, like half mile away into the business school. Took business courses until, until I spun a clarity up. You've spun out a clarity. You, you build up the company. But one of the first hires you make is Oren Schneider, who you appoint as the chief technical officer, which means that pretty early in the life of the company, that technical baby you invented, which you patented, you give it out to someone else and you say, no, I'm going to focus on the business. What's the rational and is it hard to do? It was a no-brainer to to get Oren on, on board. There still isn't anybody who would have been better suited to take over the technology side and the, the science side. He's technically our chief science officer and he's extremely motivated and passionate about making the science and the technology work. And we were such a small team at the time, and I was really kind of interested in the commercial side anyway. So I needed to make sure we could sustain the company, that we could get funds. <laughs> this funds, you know, enable resources. Every time we've leveled up in the company, it's because of a fundraiser or because of a large amount of money that's come in. Or join the team. It's been an amazing decision. He's wonderful. And he helped to drive the, the technical aspects of the product and of the, of the company while I was able to get funding, meet customers, secure partnerships. I certainly wouldn't have been able to do it if Oren, Oren didn't join the company. He's, when did he join? He's still significantly contributing now, right? Oren joined in 2019. You have this bridge between 2017 and 2019. And there's something I want to make clear here is that there's a reason why you've been the most recommended person on that microphone. I just took that straight from your LinkedIn description. You're a 2019 Forbes 30 under 30 recipient in science. You're a 2019 Lemerson MIT Award recipient. You're a 2018 Innovator of the Year by Nguyen Nua. And when I wanted to invite you in person, when I was at Aquatech, you were on the Blue Tech Forum booth. And every time I came across, it was just after your spectacular announcement of the Series A. And simply, I couldn't reach to you and I wouldn't have taken the place of potential customers because you go to a trade show to do some business, not to, to meet stupid French people. One thing is absolutely certain is you're brilliant. Yet, there's a big gap to cross between this 2017 where you spin off a clarity and now it's, it's a one-woman band until you build the team and then the rocket starts to launch. What's the biggest learning you make between these two mileposts, 2017 and 2019? 2017 to 2019 was a massive growth period for me. One of the reasons I spun out of Clarity was because I ended up winning a university like pitch challenge. It was a business challenge. At the time, I secured $26,000, which is a lot of money, right? I could make a really solid prototype. I already had a customer like the week after I won that, I had a big corporation reach out to me and say, hey, you got something really cool. Let's fund some of your research. So I got more funding on top of it. But the thing is, I had no idea how to sell it. I didn't know what it was going to look like. I didn't know 
what the massive pain points were. I was told, oh, PFAS, you can't break the chromophore bond, so PFAS isn't a market. Maybe you should focus in disinfection. For me, I was able to make quickly get a prototype. You know, it's a prototype I could test. On that prototype, we've mentioned that your technology is electrochemical. Yeah. What's the shape of that prototype? How does it look like? How would you describe it in simple terms that a muggle like me can understand? So the basis of electrochemical oxidation is there's an anode and a cathode, at least one anode and one cathode. One is negative, one is positive. You apply electricity, water flows through, and we generate a lot of oxidants. The way you can picture it, and it's still this way now, on the original prototype was this way, it's cylindrical. If you look inside, and very difficult to look inside of the reactor, so... <laughs> Not many people have seen the inside of our reactors. Um, but that being said, the inner part is as our anode. It's a cylinder. And then right just outside, there's a gap, which we've optimized. We've optimized a lot of these things. And there's further optimization to do, certainly. But we've got it to work to a point where it's functional and economic. There's this inner anode. And then right outside, there's a cathode. So the water flows in between the anode and the cathode. So they get the PFAS to stick onto the anode surface. And it's mineralized and so, it flows back out. There's no filter, you know, there's no, there's no brine, there's no waste that's formed. It's just, just, it's a straight reactor, right? Some chemical reactions. I didn't want to cut you off. I just wanted to have a concrete picture of your technology. So you, you're building the first prototype out of the 26,000 grant you, you, you got at that pitch competition. You have that industrial which comes and says, I might have an application case for you. So you're building the prototype. What's happened next? And we tested it. We sent, we sent it to a third-party accredited lab for NSF ANSI P231 testing, which is technically for bacteria and viruses. And we were looking at, huh, should this be for a big point of use or point of entry disinfection in homes or buildings? You know, that was our first, one of our first big hypotheses. And I did a lot of hypothesis testing. I didn't realize how important having a technical skill was in forming the business because you know I took some customer discovery courses and really tried to understand what's the value proposition, what other what our customers really want, right? You know, it's like really true hypothesis testing and validating like hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of them. <laughs> Your first hypothesis is point of use, point of entry. So almost B2C. What stops you from going that direction? Economics. And actually, like, so we went pretty far with a handful of strategics. We're really, really interested in, in, in funded some of this work. But um, then we discovered that we can destroy PFAS. And then we were like, ah, oh, if we have a point of entry system that's maybe going into a home or maybe into a larger apartment complex or hotel, what does that look like? And then we were just trying to understand what is the value chain? How would we sell this? Right. So that's where all the hypothesis testing comes in. The price point that we would have to get down to for PFAS destruction in simultaneous disinfection, because oh my gosh, we're destroying PFAS. We're, <laughs> we're also destroying a lot of other things, right? <laughs> Good things. The price point had to be really low. And we just weren't able to do that at the time. I think it's a worthwhile exercise to, to understand the economics now, I, many years later. The cool thing about this is it can scale up and it can scale down. I still have a, like a mini anode that we could test if we want to, but I, it's, wrap, it's wrapped up in bubble tape. <laughs> it took us two years to figure that out. And then we focused exclusively, let's see, 2021, we probably decided to make the change to focus exclusively on PFAS. We had a couple of other projects too, I guess. So maybe not exclusively, but now we're very exclusive on PFAS. But I would say 2021 was the kind of the, the turning point on PFAS. So how do you narrow down? You, you have this point of use, point of entry, first hypothesis, which you rule out for economical reason. At some point, you focus on PFAS, but you also decide where you want to, to apply your technology. And at some point, you decide to go for landfills, because as you said, the leachates of landfills are 50% of the PFAS in the world today. Is that that straightforward? Or do you test all the stuff in between? No, I tested a lot of other things, but we've got a really solid team at Clarity now. And we just recently hired a salesperson. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because the majority of the sales and the, the customers that we have have pretty much all have been inbound. They found us. The landfill side, they found us. It's not like we were actively trying to cold call and start search and, and figure things out. We didn't figure it out ourselves. They came to us, you know, with a massive problem. And so that's where we were like, <laughs> okay, price point's right. The size is right. The volumes are right. Everything made sense. Oh, and there's massive drivers on the regulatory side. There's massive drivers on the, on the economic side. But that's at the same time, 
an incredible validation of your hypothesis and the, the technology. And it's also quite dangerous, or it can be quite dangerous, because if you're found by the wrong vertical, you might then develop something for that vertical only to find out at the end that it wasn't the right one. So are you super clever or are you super lucky? It's a little bit of both. <laughs> Last year was a really pivotal year for us. Last year and the year before, so 2022, 2023. 2022, we launched our first commercial size reactor. We validated it at customer sites, at centralized waste treatment facilities and at landfills. Like, wow, we can take raw landfill leachate with parts per billion ranges of PFAS and get them down and non-detect in a single pass, one single pass through a reactor and get the, get the contaminants down to non-detect. And sometimes if we want to be more economic, we can pre-concentrate it first, which is our partnerships come in. Massive theme for our clarity, but <laughs> um, yeah, you know, some customers prefer that, that we concentrate it first and then take that concentrate down. That's the smoothest of, of all transitions. Th thanks for that. If I'm right, that 2022 commercial reference is the one you did in partnership with Dinora. We did in 2022, done some work with Dinora. We did a fair amount of, of pilots and, and a, of testing and then commercial demonstrations. One of them was with Xylem. Xylem funded one of them. Before going into the partnership and, and, and explaining what to do with them, I have just a muggle question here. Dinora does electrochemistry since the 60s. So 60 years of experience in electrochemistry. Xylem has a certain amount of brands within their full ecosystem. I would think, for instance, of Vedeco, who are pretty well into advanced oxidation. Those brands have incredibly more means and money and people than you with your little startup, which you built on your shoulders in 2017. So is it an incredible positive sign that they associate themselves to you because they recognize that you have a superior technology and you are in fields where they are not able to reach? Or is it also, you know, kind of a David and Goliath story where, where David is pretty proud that he achieved something that Goliath couldn't? My first answer is PFAS destruction is hard. It's a lot easier to break the carbon fluorine bond than we thought originally. But to do it at a commercial scale, first of all, to size something up from just a couple plates to a prototype that works, to something that can be manufactured, to something that can be deployed at a customer site, and to something that works, that is economic, clearly has taken many years. And while a lot of these corporations have massive amounts of funding, way more than a little of clarity, <laughs> we have a full team. You know, I, where are we at now? I don't know, so we're between 25 and 30 employees, right? So we are all dedicated to destroying PFAS with one product, essentially. We've been just laser focused over the last few years on destroying PFAS to the point where we're able to advance much faster than most other corporations would. Yeah, we figured it out. The others haven't, right? And so they're trying to figure out how to get ahead <laughs> and work with us. <laughs> it's a Wright Brothers story, you know? The army was trying to build a plane. They had a lot of money, but they didn't have the passion. And the Wright Brothers wanted to build a plane. They had the passion, much less money, but they did it and not the army. And then everybody convenes around around the plane. So that makes total sense to me. You mentioned how your customers and verticals came to you inbound. Was it the case for Xylem and Denora as well? Yeah, that's right. You know, I knew people at both organizations. But way back, we actually sold a system to Xylem. I think we sold a system to Xylem in 2020, maybe. It was one of our smaller reactors. But it's still the same size anode and cathode that we use now. It's different. I know they were doing some testing, but this was back, they were doing some disinfection testing, right? They were doing some PFAS testing, but kind of trying to understand what markets, it could, you know, same, same stuff that we were doing. Fast forward, we were invited to participate in Xylem's inaugural, their first Xylem Innovation Labs accelerator, essentially, for companies that had innovative technology that they were interested in. We went through that program and graduated. They funded one of our customer demonstrations. Fantastic. <laughs> like, Met the, you know, met the customer KPIs up and down and sideways. And so we graduated and have moved on to working with them. That's for Xylem, which I had the chance to have Steven Zamir and Max Sorto from the Xylem Innovation Labs on that microphone. So we delved into the program and how they are zero strings attached. I'd like to confirm that with you, but they, they don't take any equity. Is there actually a string attached? Because they tell me 
there's none, but maybe you have a different experience. There's no strings attached. That is true. Certainly when you graduate, if they decide to work with your company, then it's a mutual discussion as to how what that relationship works looks like. From a true program standpoint, there really is no strings attached. Glad you confirmed it. <laughs> I haven't been lied to. I, I, I prefer that. Xylem is a bit, you know, the, the cool kid amongst the giants. They have these innovation labs. They have a bit more of that product culture, given the way the company has been built. Dinora, on the other hand, is more of a traditional company from the image or from the outside. Was it the same experience for you to work with the two majors or what was different in your partnership with Dinora? Very different. They're both strategic relationships. Both are trying to understand the market more. They're both trying to understand how they can serve their customers better. It's been maybe surprising, maybe not surprising to me, just very honestly, that of all of the channel partners that we work with, Silum and Dinora and many others, they look to us to kind of tell them where they should be operating and how they should be operating. They are in so many, their feet are wet in, in all around the globe, <laughs> in all these different applications. They understand the need for PFAS treatment or PFAS management, but they sort of look to us to try and understand where the, where are the markets. Conversely, we look to them to say, where are your invalid? What's your pipeline? Look? That's where a lot of the value from a venture capital backed startup standpoint, right? We want to make sure that we're tapping into their pipeline, their, their sales pipeline, their projects and executing with them. We get the validation, we get the testimonials, you know, certainly we get revenue from it too. But that's from a strategic side. That's where I'm most focused. I am focused from the Xylem and Denora side. Similarly, in that way, both of these organizations have come, come about it in a very different way, which has been very different experiences. You mentioned that you're venture capital backed. I had the chance to have your VC on the microphone as well, who, by the way, is one of the people who recommended you. But that's almost what happened in the last segment of your story, because as you mentioned as well, let's talk money a bit. You started off a grant and then you kept getting grants, which finance your path. I just can't wrap my head around how you managed to be that bootstrapped over three, four years and still that successful. Was it by design? You really wanted to first get your ducks in a row and have the tech ready for the acceleration? Or was it simply because you didn't want to pitch to VCs? No, I think it was more getting our ducks in a row, getting the story right. I'm still getting the story right. <laughs> <laughs> Seven years later, <laughs> it's, it's a whole lot better. But you got to think in 2019, we had just decided to make a pivot to start looking at industrial markets. We moved away from the point of use, point of entry, hypo like the massive hypo overarching hypothesis and started looking at you know industrial markets and industrial scale systems. We hadn't manufactured anything industrial scale. We didn't really manufactured anything. We made a we made a fair amount of prototypes and tested them a lot with customers. Twenty nineteen I was I was finally ready to pitch to investors. That was the big thing. I raised money in two thousand nineteen and then raised more in two thousand twenty two. I mean three years later. I was able to get a fair amount more grants. Let me check if, if my numbers are right. When you yeah. raised in 2019, that was a pre-seed round of 700,000. And when you raised in 2022, that was the one with Burnt Allen Ventures as the lead investor, and that's 3.3 million. I'll take the acceleration later. I just want to understand. If I'm right, you've had a total of $1.3 million of grants plus the 700,000 of pre-seed. That makes more or less 2 million. So from 2017 to 2022, so five, almost six years of the life of the company, you're living off 2 million, which may sound a lot of money for someone out there in the field and doing nothing, but you're building a team. I guess you're also paying a team. You're doing 15 pilots and you're developing a technology. And really, I, I can't figure out how you did that. <laughs> I can't either. No. <laughs> Again, the word that comes to mind is scrappy. We had to be really scrappy and manage money really tightly because I wanted to make sure that when we raised, we were able to raise from the right investors. We were able to get good validation from the market in the first four years to enable us to do that. And I didn't pay myself. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of sacrifice, you know, there's a lot of sacrifice when it comes to, to, to funding a company, but I believed it. My family believed in it, right? They believed in me. They believed in the technology. They believed in the market. And so I was also able to hire people like Orin, you know, and then I closed the, the, seed, the seed round in 2022, early 2022, 22 after my second child was born. 
And then I brought people on like Pamela. <laughs> Pamela is our COO and our VP of marketing. You know, I was able to really, really start to bring a cohesive team together. We got people really super dedicated PhDs in the lab. I think we ended 2022 with about 12 people. And in 2023, we ended the team. The team was about 24. Crazy amount of growth. An incredibly strong, strong team to help us really, really propel. It's all about management of resources and making really good decisions. And I haven't made the best decisions, but I would say that overall, <laughs> relatively proud of the decisions that we've been able to make <laughs> and the progress we made with such small resources. It might be survivor bias, but from what you've built, clearly I think you can be proud. It means nothing. It's just little me in my studio saying that, but I think you have a track record which speaks for itself. You mentioned how you wanted to have the right VC on board. I'm sure Tom will never listen to that. So you, you can be absolutely open. <laughs> how is he as your VC? Oh, amazing. Tom was my first board member. Who else is better for an early stage water startup than Tom? In serious terms, what do you await from your VC? What is he bringing you? If you have like two examples of moments where you had questions from him as a board member or from him as your investor, what did he bring you? Well, I'll tell you what others would not have brought me. I probably pitched my seed round. I probably pitched 80 venture capitalists and related, right? Other funders, but mostly venture capital funds. And I was learning a ton with every pitch, right? Um, how to re refine my pitch, but also what I was looking for. I learned pretty quickly if they didn't know what PFAS was, they were off my list. Then they would have to, you know, have to educate But not only educate, but that means that they don't understand what, I, what we're going through. They don't know They don't know the market. They don't know the, these long sales cycles. Or if they were only SaaS companies or SaaS VCs, they're not going to understand the challenges of supply chain, manufacturing, customer acceptance. I had to get really smart really quickly about who I wanted to pitch to and who I wanted to get money from. And it worked out. <laughs> But it could have gone absolutely sideways. And I could have brought in some, some venture panelists that just didn't understand what we were doing and could have made things incredibly difficult. And I have somebody like Tom who, who has the Rolodex. He understands the ecosystem. He's patient. He's a cheerleader. But he's also just incredibly connected and incredibly supportive. And he inherently, I say he, Bird Island and, and the other investors I brought into the team. And I definitely don't want to wanna undermine that as well. But they get it. They know what a tough tech, hard Hardware, tough tech is hard. Tom technically isn't on the board anymore. Christine Boyle is. And I made that decision after I closed the Series A. Tom and I, of course, had a really nice heart to heart. And, you know, it just worked out best. Tom had a lot of things going on. He was raising his, his next fund. Christine Boyle is just like a mastermind in the, <laughs> in the water industry. She's been an operator. She's CEO, successful exit to Xylem. She's added incredible value. But for me to have both Tom and Christine on my team, singing praise. <laughs> It's amazing. Wayne Barron is on your board as well? Wayne is, yes. That's the other Burnt Island venture. It is, but I brought yeah. Wayne on as an independent before he was he was technically, you know, partner with Burnt Island. So he is he does represent the independent seat. I see. Coming back to, to your Series A, when I sat down with, with, with Tom end of last year, he said that he, what he would like to do, ideally, is sign the first and last check of a company. I would not mind if our companies were not re-rated a single time until we exited, that we were the last check that they took and they built a brilliant company just with that money and they compounded it over time. And then the MOIC, so the multiple on invested capital, sorry, I'm immediately into the jargon. The multiple on invested capital stays at one, which means that there hasn't been any re-rating of nobody's bought an extra share at a higher price. And then the overall outcome being 36 or whatever. And there's nothing that happens on my kind of reporting to my investors like in between. Because it means that we still own the percentage of the company that we did before. Because as you add capital onto companies, you get diluted. And that's like fine. That's just, well, you know, it is what happens. With you, he didn't sign the first check because you had a pre-seed. And he didn't sign the last check because even though... I guess Burnt Island Ventures has been part of the Series A when you're raising the, the mm -hmm. 16 millions. To him, I, I would see why it might be conflicting 
do I get it really wrong and as a finance muggle or was it part of your heart to heart conversation? Tom and I, I would say we used to talk on a weekly basis. We still talk pretty often, but not on a weekly basis by any means anymore. I think one of our first massive heart to hearts was when we were closing the seed round, right? He, he was leading the round. I did my negotiations with him. And then we made the decision about who the syndicate was going to look like. When I say the syndicate, I mean like who, who else was joining the round. We made some decisions, right? We brought DCVC on board. The DCVC, they fund founders who go on to become billion dollar companies. When we were having these conversations, you know, it's like, well, you know, you could bring them this, this federal, like, like we had a pretty good list of VCs who were in, which was a great problem. <laughs> <laughs> who do you really want? <laughs> and um, I made that decision to grow the company and change the mindset a little bit, right? To like this can be a massive company, could be right, and that's that's the, that's that's where that was like kind of the first heart to heart. I think Tom, by leading that round, and then us also bringing in some good players in the space, set us up that we are going to raise a Series A, and we're probably going to raise a Series B, and we're going to grow this to be something that's really meaningful, and it's not going to be. I think Tom knew before he came onto a clarity that this wasn't going to be his last check. I was just curious because that makes a ton of sense <laughs> in your path. Back to, to, to the timeline, 2022, you have your seed rounds with Burnt and Ventures and 2023, you have this pretty impressive 16 million Series A. It's never public information to say how much capital you gave out in that Series A, but I just did stupid maths. When I had Kobe Nagar from 374 Water on that microphone, it was just after they floated on Nasdaq. And at the time, the company was valued between 500 and 600 million dollars, roughly speaking. If I do the maths and try to, to look how much equity you would have had to give out to have the same valuation, that means your Series A was 2.6% of your capital, which I'm pretty sure you're very good at negotiations, but I doubt you would be as good as that. So <laughs> my very stupid, simple bet is that you've been raising at a significantly lower valuation. And I'm not trying to compare apples with peers, but 374 water was valued at that level because supercritical water oxidation is expected to be one of the technologies to attack PFAS, especially in landfills. So it sounds like they're down a similar alley to yours. And by the time they raised money, they had one functional pilot at Duke uh, University. When you have 15 pilots and a commercial reference. So I'm wondering, how do you look at those numbers? Do you think like, hmm, I may be undervalued or you're super happy because you're not public, which means you don't have the same levels of reporting to do and stuff like that. What's your gut feeling about that? Is it really like my observer, stupid, railbird question? And for you, it's absolutely not a topic. To be honest with you, it's not something that keeps me up too much evaluation of our company. Certainly, certainly was more than 2.5% of the company, as you can expect, right? Listen, 374 are very different companies. We're attacking a similar market. I don't think that they're operating too much in landfill each day anymore. I don't think any of our customers necessarily are considering supercritical water oxidation for a variety of reasons, mostly economics and others, right? Um, but we're all learning. We're all learning where we fit best. We closed the Series A, Aquilateral led the round, and I cannot recommend them. Allison and Jitin are some of our biggest supporters, of course, <laughs> but like they live it and breathe it. And that's been amazing. So Aquilateral on board, we've got Heritage Group, we've got Pedro, we've got Mass Ventures, Burnt Island, Noracer, so, some, of these, um, some other some other funds that have come on board as well. And I feel very good at where the company is, what we've raised, what our valuation is. I feel like we're not overinflated. I think we may have. Maybe could have raised higher, but you know what? We did a fair amount of negotiating. <laughs> There's a lot of negotiating on both sides. <laughs> then we ended up in a really good place. And we were able to build the team, build the technology, and prove it out in, in the field on that basis with good people around. And to me, there's nothing more important than having the right people on board. And we're not public, which is which is nice. Um, you know, it comes with its own challenges as well, but I'm not, you know, both ways. But yeah. the good people is, is a red thread in everything you said since the beginning. So it sounds absolutely logical that you're not at that stage looking just for money, but also for people, partners, bouncing people, which you can just jot ideas to them and they will bounce back or tell you, no, that's that's actually a very good one. That makes a ton of sense. You mentioned how you're no longer hunting in the same waters than 374 Water. Nevertheless, there's a pack of technologies which are addressing the PFAS challenge. You have the mainstream main market ones, the one you mentioned, which will be on the list of EPA recommended. So activated carbon ion exchange. And then 
just after that first pack, you have your big box with electrochemical technologies. I would think here of companies like Axin Water, which has been on the microphone before, Oxile, to give you a Swiss example, which has been on the microphone as well in, in the past. So you're not alone in, in, that, in that sphere. But I would give you the credit that you're leading the pack. There's supercritical water oxidation, which is which is something, but you have also pyrolysis, sonolysis, plasma. How do you look at those companies? Is it like you're all of you trying to open a market where you're trying to bring across the message? It's not just about separating PFAS from the water or separating PFAS from the leachate, but it's about destroying it. And in that exception, it will not be a winner take all. So fine, everybody will carve its own niche. Or do you see it as, hmm, if plasma makes it big, maybe that's a risk? If any of the PFAS destruction technologies are successful, however we define successful, but if but even there, there are many successes, then we are successful, right? The PFAS management market, however you manage it, is just incredibly dynamic and ominous. <laughs> you yeah, know, and so if any one of these technology companies can break through and have some really good traction, it just validates the market even more. And it validates that there's a, that there's a true need for this. Now I can go back and say, okay, well, economics shows that there's a need, right? If, you know, a waste water treatment plant is charging 10 cents a gallon and we can do it for less, then there's a market, <laughs> right? But it's not as easy as that. All of that to say, there's a place for all of us. The market and our companies are learning where our sweet spots are. From a technical standpoint and from an economic standpoint. And I can tell you with very high certainty, our biggest sweet spot right now as a company is destroying PFAS and landfill leachate. It's a home run. The other companies, the the supercritical water oxidation technology companies, the plasma companies, and, and those kind of in between are all, I think, still figuring out really where they where they fit from a technology and economic standpoint. And then market, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, we're not all going to go after drinking water that, as as fast as we probably would. Maybe a remediation of a uh, of a you know of a lagoon. That's typically where we find kind of some of these companies have emergencies. They have all this PFAS. The town is making them get rid of it. They don't know what to do. They have to truck it. It's going to cost you know many dollars per gallon in order to truck it. And then they have to incinerate it, and that's many more ga- dollars per gallon. This is crisis, right? That's emergent. That's an emergency where 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 a lot of us could potentially play. I have. Two questions for that answer. The first is you mentioned you can be much cheaper than 10 cents per gallon. How much cheaper? That's my first question. And my second question is in your sweet spot of leachate treatment, I'd like to address your business model, which if I'm right, is treatment as a service. So that's two different two different buckets, but I put you there. You can choose which one you want to answer first. First question is how much cheaper? Everybody's got to love my answer, but it depends. <laughs> <laughs> I'll explain real quick. So the biggest factors that influence our economics are the volume of the stream per day, the starting PFAS concentration, and the final, you know, effluent discharge concentration. So you can imagine if you're taking 100 micrograms per liter, that's parts per billion, knocking it down by 50%. It's going to take less capital, less equipment than if we were to knock it down by 99.999%. So it's going to be more expensive to do that. On the other hand, if we take something that is high volume and low concentration, we may decide, let's concentrate it up. That pre-concentration step, which is where partners come in. Concentrate it up, become smaller volume, we get higher concentrations. We're able to more effectively degrade some of those higher concentrations down to a level that could be acceptable to the customer. Now we've got something that's more economic. How much less? It truly depends. And I kind of threw 10, 10 cents a gallon out, but that's typically what we see. 10, maybe we're doing five and 30 cents a gallon to discharge to a wastewater treatment plant. We're talking lots of gallons. I'm talking and gallons. Sorry about that. <laughs> but it's a lot, it's a lot of money. You know, we can solve the customer's problems, at least their economic problem, and then their risk problem, because now they don't have to do all the transportation. They can do the destruction there. It goes to the second question, which is our business model. Business model. We've trademarked this as destruction as a service. We are truly, it's a build own operate model. We deploy the equipment on site. We do all, regardless, right? We do, you know, all the checks, the startup commissioning, customer acceptance, 
roll right into a service model. We charge on a cost per gallon basis, you know, on a monthly basis, and we essentially assume responsibility and liability of that treatment. So that means you're taking guarantees over the level of PFAS in the treated effluent? For, yes, for the majority of pro projects, yes. That's where I like to understand, because I'm not a PFAS specialist, I'm not pretending to be, but when I was reading some articles to prepare for that conversation, there were concerns about your ability to destroy short chain. So there's long chain, short chain, Genics, and everybody agreed, all the papers I read agreed that your technology is awesome for, for, for long chain. And although nobody said it's it's shit for, for, for short chain, not saying that, but they expressed some reserves about your ability to destroy short chain. So would you share those concerns or do you say, no, no, they don't know what they're talking about? <laughs> No, I mean, it, it's valid. When we were when we were first starting with our commercial systems, 2022, 2023, when we were de deploying our first commercial reactors, we inherently had a, a different system than we're operating now because the market was just so focused on PFOA and PFOS. We were targeting on, let's get the system to just knock PFOA and PFOS and a lot of the other compounds down to as low as we possibly can for the lowest amount of energy, inherently the lowest cost. And then come early 2023, things change, right? EPA announces the CERCLA. Again, I'm speaking from the U.S. standpoint, but the, but it's fairly similar in Europe. EPA now changes. They say, okay, you know, we're gonna we're gonna regulate really designate PFOA and PFOS as hazardous substances under the CERCLA liability law. And then a couple months later, they say, oh, actually, we're gonna be adding a couple more too to include PFBS and some of these small small chain compounds. They did the same thing with the safe drinking water. Then they came back and they said, okay, well, PFOA and PFOS, we need to get down to four parts per trillion. We can have a whole other conversation about. <laughs> but a lot of these other compounds, including Gen X, you know, there's this hazard index that they're trying to meet. The long story short of this is the industry doesn't just care about PFOA and PFOS anymore, which are long chain compounds. They care about pretty much down to C4, which is interesting too. C1 to C3, it's like, oh, why do you know carry real thousands? <laughs> but anyways, here we are. <laughs> the majority of the legislation now is C4, so it's four carbon carbon chains. Mm -hmm. to C9. Now we're like, whoa, you know, we saw this coming, right? So in 2022, we started we started making some process enhancements and some changes. And we got it to a point where we can demonstrate that we can degrade these long chain compounds and the short chain compounds at the same rate, which is actually quite amazing because then that makes the sizing of our systems fairly simple. If the customer says my total PFAS concentration is 100 micrograms, we can then say, okay, well, I know that degradation rate constant, just about the same. Now I can design a full scale system for that total PFAS and get it down to, again, that total PFAS number or individual species if state or the region is concerned about a couple species here and there. You can do that as well. Just makes it a lot easier. I will say we've done amazing work in scaling this up. We still struggle a little bit with PFBA. We've been able to degrade PFPS, along PFHPA, a lot of the other short chain compounds very well at a similar rate. PFBA, still struggling. We've got plans and we've got a, certainly a short chain program here at Clarity to, to make sure we can get all of them. The same papers I was re referring to, which were saying you might have troubles with short chain, also mentioned how other technologies might have troubles with long chain and so far and so on, or Genix is going to be the, the, the troublesome one. Even GAC. Yeah, I mean, they even yeah. they, they all struggle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You touched a bit on, on the EPA. I remember because it was my first time in my life in New York around the time when this health advisory from the EPA came out. And so PFAS in that form is, is a lot of a US topic. We address it quite differently in Europe. It was very, very interesting to speak with people because some were really running around like incredible. You, you had all these studies showing how much it would cost for water, wastewater treatment systems, if you had to implement something, the magnitude of the health advisory. And some others saying, come on, it's a health advisory. It doesn't constrain in any ways anybody. So that was the first step. Now we have these four parts per trillion regulation, which was supposed to come into force end of last year, but to my knowledge is still not in place. If that comes out right now, I would see that as a bittersweet thing for you. Because if drinking water system have to go down to four parts per trillion, that means they're going to put massive amounts of activated carbon and ion exchange. So if the regulation says you have to make the water down to that and that's it, then you will have a bit more of a market with the ones which want to do that right and which want to take the exhausted carbon and 
treat it and want to take the brines of the ion exchange and treat it. But if regulation doesn't force them to do so, it's basically a cost to be in business, which they don't have to assume. Now, the other thing which regulation could do is to say, not only do you have to go to four parts per trillion, but you also have to eliminate those PFAS, in which case jackpots, I mean, GWI was estimating that just the upgrade of going to four parts per trillion without destruction was a $10 billion dollars market over six years. So if now we say we double down by eliminating those PFAS, you will not even have to pick your VCs, but you will have to simply <laughs> close your capital because everybody will want to be on board with you. So how do you see that regulation and how do you navigate a topic which can be a bit of a moving target? Great question. The EPA has decided to regulate. EV is moving quickly. There are people out there that are saying it's not, it's not moving fast enough. And well, I guess I can see their point. This is the fastest I think they've ever especially regulating one one substance. The approach that they took originally was to regulate PFAS in drinking water, as she said, first. And then they came out with the Circulo rule, which is not, again, it's not, none of this is in full force yet. He recently came out with a RICRA, which basically would make the stores, handlers, and, and traders of PFAS waste. And so they're coming at it from many different directions. How does that affect a clarity? Our customers are extremely worried <laughs> That's not the best word. <laughs> they're unsure. When we work with customers, they're typically, the town wastewater treatment plant wants us to meet drinking water regulations. We can't even test PFAS in landfill leachate right now at four PPT. It's not going to happen. It's too low. There's too many other things in there. They have too many interferences and too, so much uncertainty. They can't get the method detection limit. But the wastewater treatment plants don't have a really good answer, the, the landfills as to really what the final goal should be. So these landfills are just saying, basically saying, okay, we got to get this down to as low as we possibly can, but we don't really have a real answer <laughs> until the EPA comes in. They're likely to be regulated, perhaps circular, perhaps RICRA, depending on exemptions and whatnot. But the big one that all of the landfills are looking out for, and most of the industries that we operate in, even outside of landfills, is in the Clean Water Act. And that's what basically gives states the guidance and mandate to make sure that there's permits around the discharge. That's the big one. And for and for landfills, it's really this Plan 15. So the question is, well, what's Plan 15 going to say? I'm just spiraling going pretty deep in here, but, but the way that the Clean Water Act works is that they regulate each industry individually. They basically have a prioritized list of which industries they're regulating first for PFAS and rolling them out. They are starting to roll them out. The whole thing of this is that it is so incredibly frustrating and worrisome and ambiguous to the industry as to what they really need to treat to, how they're going to treat it or manage it, and what the liabilities are looking like. We're just doing our best to make sure that we can meet their needs now and that we have the, the capability to add on and build to the system as regulations get stricter and more compounds become regulated. I mentioned several times how I'm a muggle. I'm I double down as a muggle when it comes to American politics, given my, my French nature. In my research for that episode, I found that there was, I can't remember if it's 250 or 400 different PFAS bills at state level in the States, which will be discussed in the Euro 2024. So I guess that state level will have a strong influence as well on, on your trajectory, not just the federal level, but also at state level. And I remember, now I'm going to say something more stupid than me because I can't remember how many states already have PFAS regulations, but I, I remember that the state of New York, for instance, already has a PFAS regulation in place. Federal level is one thing, but the US being a federal state means that the states as well have, have their say here. I don't want to take you down a sidetrack, given the fact that I'm already 25 minutes of a board for, <laughs> for the entire interview, and I still have one question in the deep dive and then the rapid fire. So one thing is you said you, you want to build something big, and that's an incredible ambition. And I really think that you have what it takes to, to build something big. Nevertheless, you mentioned how when Barn is the independent representative on your board, when he was on that microphone two years ago, he mentioned that Typhoon, which he was leading at the time, was setting itself up to being a knife in a street fight. Meaning that when Titans would fight it out because regulations for Typhoon, it was regulations on, on vapor mercury lamps, but when regulations would tighten and straighten up the Titans markets, they would have to look for something which is an agile company out there, and then they would grab the agile company as the knife in the street fight. I could definitely see that happening for you as well. If EPA takes super strong regulations, if the European Union goes a bit more 
out of their way and start to not looking at the total PFAS like they do today, but take even stronger regulations and so far and so on. You are Suez, Xylem, Veolia, whoever in that market, you know that you don't have that agility and that Wright Brothers team within the company. You need to look for a knife in order to win in the street fight. And what's the best knife out there? I think we've established in, in the past one hour 20 that you're a good contender to being that knife. When you say build a giant, is it something totally independent or would you see yourself at some point exiting to one of those big groups? The short answer is very likely we will exit to one of those groups. Even just looking at the history of companies like Aclarity, maybe not companies like Aclarity, but companies in the water space, very common to become acquired. We haven't seen a market like PFAS. First of all, the market is undefined <laughs> still, but it's getting closer. It's getting closer. And, and, and to your point, everybody is trying to put numbers to it, which is good for us. We haven't seen this type of dynamic market, which does open kind of like Pandora's box for, could this be a massive company? I think we could be a billion dollar company. Are we going to be a billion dollar company? We'll see how the market responds. I'm not sure. However, is PFAS management, treatment, remediation, destruction going to be a part of it? a part of the, the 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 market and it's like absolutely absolutely we're already seeing it now we've got solid customer testimonials we've got full-scale equipment in the field we're working with who i think are the right partners and building our, par our our partnership portfolio i talk almost exclusively about pfas but i did start the conversation to say man this can do a lot <laughs> <laughs> right i haven't talked about ammonia but we've got well, there's tons of ammonia issues with uh, especially industrial wastewater and layoff leaching and whatnot. Now, yeah, disinfection, other types of contaminants of emergency concern, BOD, COD, conventional, you know, conventional treatment. I say conventional, but, you know, advanced oxidation treatment, you know, in textiles and other types of industrial applications. We have the ability to spin off different business units and this is spin off, but, you know, create different business units to solve different problems. And we have an inherently one skew, one Product. I can essentially do it all, which is really quite unique. It's actually it's unique, but it is it is it's a little bit like reverse osmosis. RO membranes, like you pretty much have RO membranes. <laughs> Each of them has their own little, you know, their own service characteristics and things along those lines. RO membranes are very good at removing everything. We have the ability to customize ours so we can we can destroy some things, like we can destroy PFAS, or maybe simultaneously we destroy other things, um, but we do have the ability to customize it. All of that to say, there's a lot of potential here, and it, it just, it, it, a lot of it's going to be dependent on the market. And then it's going to depend on on what the company really wants to do, who comes along, <laughs> 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 what opportunities there are. <laughs> And I'm pretty tight. Like I'm, I, yeah, I'm pretty flexible with the true outcome, but I just know the outcome is going to be really big. I'm a bit frustrated because I had a ton of pleasure to discuss with you in that deep dive, and there are so many doors open which I could go down. But that just means that not only did you have to be there because you've been recommended, but you have to be back at some point because we need to go down those different routes and and those other markets and everything you want to spin off and so far and so on. So thanks a lot for everything you shared in that deep dive conversation and and all the openness. If that's fine with you, I'd like to switch to the last segment, which is the rapid fire questions. It's time for the rapid fire questions. What is the toughest challenge in your opinion for a water tech startup? Market adoption and resources needed to grow the company. What would be your best single piece of advice for the founders and managers of the about 1000 early stage water startups? Listen to the market, build something very quick, test it and see if See how your customers react. What's the drop of knowledge you wish more investors knew about the water sector? The first one that comes to mind is not the right answer, but it's that I think the people in the water in the water sector are awesome, super easy to work with, very nice, very good people. It's not the best thing that they should know, <laughs> but I think that just there's incredible passion. You can't you can't find more passion. What was your most unexpected partnership, and what did it bring you? I'm going to answer the partnership in terms of funders, and it was um, Aqualateral. Equilateral rating, uh, leading the Series A. And what did they bring us? Capital. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but an immense amount of support and resources. They've been fantastic. Yeah. Along with Burnt Island, for sure. Super short, profitability or growth? Grief. What's the next profile you'll hire? An industrial water tech. <laughs> we need more field people. When you hire, are you looking for a sector experience or startup experience? Nearly sector experience. 
I, I take a sidetrack here and you correct me if I'm wrong, but on your website, there are several openings. So if you're listening to that, you found Julie super cool, which I would find she is super cool. Go on the website. There's also a job board on Burnt Island Ventures website where you can find some more jobs. And if that's a fit, I think there, there's some 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 challenges to take on and, and some some great time to have. So my, my little plug, you can make big signs if you're no longer hiring because all your positions are taken. Yeah. <laughs> We're always hiring. <laughs> if we're not hiring, we're in trouble. <laughs> Opening new markets or doubling down on the current ones? Opening new markets. You gave a hint at the end. It's going to be risky. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's that tool nobody speaks about, but you couldn't live without? A lame answer, but Google Calendar. <laughs> Can't live without it. <laughs> Very good one. I put my family dinners in Google Calendar. <laughs> What's the single piece of insight your ideal customer profile needs to hear right now? Full scale economic PFAS destruction is here. Give us a chance. What are you desperately needing and want to raise an open call for right now? We need a proofreader. <laughs> Our team is so good at really good content and getting proposals out and everything, but we lack a proofreader on the team. The word is out, so? Last question. <laughs> what can and should I do for you? And I'm not a good proofreader. When you hear of companies who have anything to do with any kind of PFAS problem, bring them to us um, or our competitors. I mean, honestly, or our competitors. If any of us are super successful, we're all going to be super successful. We play in different markets and we have different strengths, but um, getting like breaking the myths of PFAS destruction is just such a central topic for me. The more we talk about how those myths are broken. A rising tide raises all boats. So. That's right, it does. Julie, it's been a pleasure again. If people want to follow up with you, where's the best place for me to redirect them to? Email, email or LinkedIn. So as always, those are in the description. So go check it out. If you have a project, if you have anything which was listed in, in the needs and, and, and wants of, of a clarity, don't hesitate to reach out. It's been a super pleasure. I'm super sorry. I've been very French on that one. We have 40 minutes of a board, which is not a habit, but gives you a hint at how cool you were. So thanks a lot. And okay. talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Antoine. Thank you. New segment in this season 11, the seven things to take home from today's conversation for the ones that don't have a paper and a pen with them during the interview. That's my way to share you my notes. And narrowing the insights shared by Julie to just seven was a challenge, but hey, it's the rule I set, so here we go. Starting with number one, focus on market needs and testing hypotheses. A Clarity's approach to developing and pivoting its technology is fully based on market feedback and rapid prototyping. Indeed, Julie emphasizes the importance of listening to the market, building and adapting hypotheses, and adjusting based on customer feedback. A great example of that is how Aclarity pivoted from a B2C focus in point of entry or point of use applications to tackling PFAS in landfill leachate in a pragmatic approach linked to economic realities. Let's see, 2021, we've probably decided to make the change to focus exclusively on PFAS. We had a couple of other projects too, I guess, so maybe not exclusively, but now we're very exclusive on PFAS, but I would say 2021 was the kind of the, the turning point on PFAS. Number two, innovate in niche markets before expanding. Once that pivot done, a clarity strive to nail its niche. We develop and deploy proprietary systems that destroy PFAS and liquid waste. We focus mostly in destroying PFAS where it is found, you know, in, in a decent concentration, decent bulk concentration, we found that destroying PFAS in landfill leachate is a really good place to start. Almost 50% of PFAS that's manufactured ends up in a landfill, in the trash. And these landfills are under a lot of scrutiny right now. <laughs> From this focus on PFAS destruction in landfill leachate, Aclarity now considers expanding into broader applications. And that's only possible because of their strong foothold in that first vertical, which allows for in-depth understanding, customer references and testimonials that will enable scaling and exploring additional applications. Number three, customer-driven development. Now you may wonder, where did that landfill leachate niche actually come from? Well, a Clarity has only recently hired a specific salesperson. Before that, the majority of the sales and the, the customers that we have have pretty much all have been inbound. They found us. The landfill side, they found us. It's not like we were actively trying to cold call and search, search and, and figure things out. We didn't figure it out ourselves. They came to us, you know, with a massive problem. And so that's where we were like, <laughs> okay, price point's right. The size is right. The volumes are right. 
everything made sense. This highlights the importance of developing solutions that address pressing market problems and letting those challenges drive innovation and product development efforts. Number four, leverage strategic partnerships and investments. Julie highlights several times and across numerous dimensions how a Clarity has benefited from strategic partnerships from investors like Berntel and Ventures and Aqualateral to collaboration with larger companies like Xylem or Denora. For startups, selecting the right partners and investors who understand the market challenges and offer more than just capital can accelerate growth and development. In hindsight, though Julie had a cheat code to rule many potential partners out, they had to know what PFAS are. Bonus in this one, sometimes the one to know is not the one you'd expect. Said differently, even giants sometimes need startups to show them the way. It's been maybe surprising, maybe not surprising to me, just very honestly, that of all of the channel partners that we work with, Silum and Nora and many others, they look to us to kind of tell them where they should be operating and how they should be operating. Number five, preparation for regulatory compliance. Talking of the PFAS challenge, the anticipation and preparation for future regulatory changes, such as those currently cooked by the US EPA on treatment and disposal, underscore the importance of startups being proactive in compliance and regulatory matters. The big one that all of the landfills are looking out for, and most of the industries that we operate in, even outside of landfills, is in the Clean Water Act. And that's what basically gives states the guidance and mandate to make sure that there's permits around the discharge. That's the big one, and for and for landfills, it's really this Plan 15. This forward-looking approach ensures readiness to adapt and capitalize on regulatory shifts. And come on, we know how regulation is a driver in the water sector. Number six, strategic hiring and team building. One of Julie's first hires when building a Clarity's team was a chief science officer even though she was the brain behind the company's first patent and original science. It was a no-brainer to, to get Oren on, on board. There still isn't anybody who would have been better suited to take over the technology side and the, the science side. Oren joined the team. It's been an amazing decision. He's wonderful. And he helped to drive the, the technical aspects of the product and of the, of the company. While I was able to get funding, meet customers, secure partnerships, certainly wouldn't have been able to do it if Orin, Orin didn't join the company. That's a great example of strategic focus on where she would add the most value and where empowering her team would be the most beneficial. By the way, if that's appealing to you, a Clarity has several positions open. The link is in the description. Number seven, bootstrapping and careful financial management. A Clarity's initial years were marked by bootstrapping and leveraging grants, which required careful financial management and strategic decision making to maximize the impact of limited resources. It's all about management of resources and making really good decisions. And I haven't made the best decisions, but I would say that overall, <laughs> relatively proud of the decisions we've been able to make <laughs> and the progress we made with such small resources. This, strat this strategy allowed a clarity to reach significant milestones without diluting equity prematurely and ensured they had the rubber on the ground and ready for acceleration when the time for that had come. As I said, I could have taken more, but I think seven is a good chunk to go out and apply. So here you have it. If you think I've missed one that's even more important than those seven, come tell me on LinkedIn or by mail. My mail is in the description. And remember, that episode came to you free of charge, but I would believe not free of value. It takes me quite some time to put all of those together every week. So all I'm asking is for you to help me distribute them. So take this episode, share it with a friend, a colleague, your boss, or your team, and I'll be back with another one next week. Thanks for listening to Don't Waste Water. This podcast was brought to you by GF Piping Systems. Loved this episode? Head over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. See you next time.